Welcome to DLSN, a podcast brought to you by McGuire Woods. DLSN promotes the advancement of women in private equity and finance through conversations with women in the private equity and finance space. These conversations provide both insights and practical takeaways to inform your deal work and enhance the culture of your organization. If you're ready to drive the industry toward a more inclusive and diverse environment, then it's time to come to the table. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Deal Us In. I'm Ann Dorsett, and with me today is Meredith Carter, CEO of Edge Capital. Meredith, before we get started with our discussion, tell us a little bit about yourself and about Edge Capital. Thanks for having me, Ann and McGuire Woods. Yes, I'm Meredith Carter, CEO of Edge Capital Lending. We're a family office-backed specialty finance company located outside of Philadelphia, and we focus on providing asset-based loans to lower middle market companies. I started my career in law. I practiced uh, corporate law and corporate litigation in a firm in Wilmington, Delaware, and left there after about seven years to join a family office-backed litigation funding company in the patent litigation funding space. So that was my transition from the practice of law into niche specialty finance. And we sold that company to a UK-based funder that was based in the U.S. And the family office asked if I would take a look at this asset-based loan portfolio they had that never lost a penny but wasn't growing very much. To which I answered, I don't know anything about asset-based lending, but I'd be happy to take a look at it because I really like the family office involved. So the day that I entered the ABL world. I walked into a room that was much like many other rooms in asset-based lending, really archaic manual processes uh, down to no CRM system, people uh, calculating things on calculator tape and printing it out and walking it down the hall. And um, I realized about myself in that moment that I liked walking into a mess and cleaning it up. There was only really up to go from there, really talented people, but needed a plan and execution behind it. So over the past um, almost seven years now, I've been leading what is now Edge Capital into a growth. We went, we started from two loans when I joined, and we now have almost half a billion in commitments. Wow. Now we're going to kind of dive into some more detailed and focused questions. Um, my first question for you, Meredith, is what do you think the biggest challenge is facing women in finance? Sure. I heard studies where women tend to be more accurate when they're providing projections, and sometimes that works to their advantage. When pitching to men, men assume that all people are inflating their numbers and apply a discount to it. And I think women, myself included, tend to be more exacting in this. And for example, for the past six years, we've come within 5% of our projections. But I think, you know, when it comes to fundraising, like when I was a corporate lawyer representing women entrepreneurs, I found this to be an issue. And even now in funding, I think women, through their quest to be accurate, end up undercutting themselves. So should we start inflating? (laughs) (laughs) No, that's a good question. I I think just an awareness uh, on the finance side that this could be an issue, asking for examples of projections they've made in the past and how close people have stayed to them could be a way to do that. I also think that women tend to not think big enough sometimes. When I have gone to you know women entrepreneur conferences or women in finance conferences, they're not reaching for the sky typically. Uh, it's usually the men who are more likely to do that. The women are focused on a niche space or, or solving the problem in front of them rather than coming up with a BHAG, the big, hairy, audacious goal, as they say, to try to be the biggest, the best, the most profitable, whatever uh, their particular KPIs are. So just not going for it, I think, could be another potential challenge facing women in finance. Right. I, I've seen some reports and studies that you know, with a job that has five points, if a man has one, he's like, I'm the best candidate. And women feel like they have to have all five. So I admire your leaps that you've made to show that you can succeed if you only have one or two of those skill sets jumping in. 
Thank you. I feel like the key to that is just being honest about it and uh, being honest about what you're good at, being honest about your blind spots. And if you find yourself among people who don't appreciate that, you're probably in the wrong place. So what character traits do you feel like you have that have benefited you in in making these leaps and, and getting to where you are today? I think I've always been someone who likes to look at things from a novel perspective. So whether it be looking at litigation funding or now with asset-based loans, I think my success with the team in, in doing that comes from the ability to look at things objectively and have now a combination of, of really expert people in our field, I, I would argue are best in class, but also a bunch of people who are learning along the way and can ask a lot of questions as to why are things done that way? Well, do we want to do it a different way um, and not really be wed to the past? I also think that at the company, we have very high standards, mostly in who we hire. We spend a lot of time in that regard, and I think that's paid off in dividends with a really close-knit culture where people have complementary strengths and get along very well. What are some of the barriers to female leadership that you've seen, and, and how did you, in recognizing those, how did you address those challenges? Sure. I think one mistake that women make is they sort of peg themselves as the underdog to begin with. I think, as Maya Angelou said, you may not control the events that happen to you, but you can decide not to be reduced by them. Mm, Great. That's great. I really like that quote. And I think that coming in and giving your best and letting the work speak for itself, not being afraid to ask for what you want women can have the same opportunities as men. Some of it, I think, largely these days is a mindset shift that all, both women and men, have to appreciate. So in looking at Edge's website and and seeing the diversity that you have on your team, in an industry where women leaders are still a rarity, what do you see as the value of women of your standing working with other women in the same firm? I think that having women in leadership And working alongside other women in leadership, you really have a style that people who are aspiring to higher positions can relate to, something that might come across as more genuine if there were specific things in uh, more senior leaders that they wanted to emulate. When I first started practicing law, it felt like a little bit there's room for one of us in the class as, as women. And I really feel like that that it's very different now from when I first started my career in the law practice, I I do feel like women are banding together more. And that's definitely a positive thing. There are a lot of other groups that through their mutual affiliations help each other. And I'm I'm happy that that our half of the population is doing the same thing. Yep, exactly. So what is a goal that you've set for yourself in the coming year? I think continued learning is always a goal of mine. Uh, Continued truth seeking. Also, staying up to date with the latest innovations in technology and how they might apply to our business. I also want to spend some time shadowing all of the groups within our company to get a better sense of what they do day to day and their pain points so I can have a better perspective on on helping them break down any barriers to success. So tell us some strategies that you think can help women advance in their organizations. I think that women should make clear to anyone senior to them what they want. To, to ask for it, to let people know what direction they want to progress in within the organization. Because like I said before, sometimes it's not just you're a victim, it's just you didn't tell anybody. So I think getting exposure to things requires speaking up and telling people what exactly you'd want exposure to. I do think that most people, I would say, are really open-minded and, and generous with their time when they see someone taking initiative to learn. I also think when when you see women advance in in organizations and they they speak up and and ask questions and say what they want, you're showing other women that it's safe to do that. And that's a gift you can give future generations of aspiring leaders. That is an excellent point. And I do think that there's a hesitancy to ask for help. And that's kind of the way mentorship starts is by being able to ask somebody a question and As somebody who's been asked questions, I'm always thrilled to be able to answer a question and help somebody wiggle through or untwist a knot. So asking questions, don't be afraid to do it. That's my advice. In what ways do you think inclusion is important in your role? 
I think making sure that we have a group of people with complementary strengths and perspectives so that we can represent the views of all potential people or all potential borrowers and understand what they might like or be sensitive to really provides an advantage in business. If you're just surrounding yourself with people that look out the same window through the same lens, you might be missing a really important market sector or delivery method that might may or may not resonate with other people. I also think that it's important to model a culture of respect for all as a leader of the organization, especially more junior people. When you ask for their opinions in a group setting, you're showing that you want to hear from them and they care. I also think it's important for women leaders who have the ability to do so to hold women and men to the same standards when it comes to potential childcare responsibilities. I've heard people say, well, you should make it easier for women to leave work when they need to. I think the real benefit would be to give men the ability to leave work at the same time. So it's not giving this implied message that women have that responsibility unto themselves. Yes. When it's equally spread out, work-life balance will no longer be a topic of conversation. So what are the benefits to being a woman in the workplace and in particular in this industry? I read studies that there are there is improved collaboration and communication when there are women in positions of leadership, increased creativity. I think you can be a role model to your children or your, your daughters, especially as a woman in the workplace. And I've heard some of the spouses on my team when they join, you know, maybe a couple months later say, like, you can tell this organization is run by a woman because I guess some of the detailed things that that we do across the team as women leaders to make sure people feel heard and taken care of and and nurtured, maybe in a, in a way or with nuances that, uh, generally speaking, might not be as important to men. So as women try to, you know, our women listeners try to carve out the best path, what do you recommend that they do to prepare themselves for that journey? I think really get out there, ask questions. If you have graduated from a a school or, or, you know, law school, MBA program to take advantage of your alumni networks and just understand what options are available to you. You should really know what you're getting yourself into when you're starting your career. And it helps to talk to a lot of people um, further along just so you can picture what your day looks like. I like to use the expression, uh, you know, do you like to see what that ghost of Christmas future looks like? And if it doesn't seem appealing to you, you might want to pivot your strategy or career aspirations. And you're an example of somebody who's pivoted and pivoted successfully. So I think, you know, being prepared to pivot and jump is an important thing, not only, you know, for men and women, it's our career paths take long and winding roads. So do you have any specific advice for somebody who's going into a leadership position like you're in now? As I said before, I think admit your weaknesses openly, point to where others can add value so they see where they are contributing to the team and ask for feedback. Uh, Don't let your ego stop you from making changes that could benefit you as a leader and and the company as a whole. Looking back as you, um, you know, if you've made this journey, can you share with us any good advice that you've received? I'm going to go back to my high school track coach. One time we were taking a shorter route in cross-country practice, I think. And he said to a group of us, you're only hurting yourself. And that really stuck with me and, you know, came into the career side of things. So when when you think you should take a shortcut or not give something your all, I remember that piece of advice and um, come back to it. And I think it, you know, I hold myself accountable to a different standard as a result of that. That is great advice. And I love these interviews that we do because I always find I, I always find a connection with people. I, too, was a distance runner in high school and loved hill work just because I knew it was so hard. Absolutely. I have fond memories of, of hill work. <laughs> <laughs> so let's turn specifically to the success that Edge Capital represents in terms of diversity and your own success in leading a diverse workforce. What are the strategies that you found most effective in recruiting and retaining women? 
I think in recruiting women, now more so we're about 50% women in our organization. So when people look at our website, that more so speaks for itself. But I think early on, it was showing them the differences in culture that we can offer in terms of giving them a voice and maybe cutting down some of the barriers they've they've seen in the past to moving ahead in their larger organization. I've also found that working in a permanently remote work environment like we do does provide some benefits, generally speaking, to women or anyone who's maybe a little bit shy with us all being in equal rectangles on a screen, it doesn't promote the type of maybe inadvertent behavior of if you're not the loudest one in the room, people will have their back turned to you. People can see when you want to speak and people can raise that little hand or I really do think it's a great equalizer for those who may be a little bit more hesitant to speak up in a group setting or maybe they're not even being faced. That's an interesting point about uh, Zoom calls. It's very obvious, too, if you're not paying attention. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Uh, So can you share some examples of tangible benefits that you've experienced from working with diverse teams, in particular, a strong representation of, of women in deal work in particular? Sure. When we are going through the hiring process, we have everyone uh, take a DISC assessment where we learn their communication style and workplace motivators. And in that process, what we do is overlay this potential candidate strength to the group they're joining and the team as a whole to figure out what perspectives, strengths, and and blind spots they may be filling. So by having a diverse team, I think we can, to fill out those blind spots a little more and also let everyone on the team play to their strengths. I also think that communication and problem solving, I've heard, tend to go a little bit more easily with women and, and not maybe escalate to the point of more vocal conflicts. Yeah. So do you think that's like one of the leadership styles that women bring to the table? And are there any others that you can think of that contribute to organizational success? I do. Yes. Problem solving, communication, being caring about others, uh, kind of crossing that line. It's not just solely personal and professional. We think women tend to have closer relationships or uh, on average, Um, Women tend to be more collaborative, nurturing, organized, and uh, sensitive to people feeling included on average than men might be in similar roles. And we talked about, you know, navigating the path to success, but, and we've also talked about work balance and work balance remains an issue for any, it's still, you know, women still bear a bigger load of what goes on behind the front door of their house. So what is your advice in navigating career advancement in this industry while balancing the personal responsibilities that we have? I would say pick your spots. So I have two children and I always encourage people on my team to make sure they don't miss the big things. They're going to regret that long term and and regret the time that they spent with you if you don't let them go to the big things. You can't get that time back. I think it's important. Someone gave me the advice early on when I was a a new mom of say yes to the things where your kids see you uh, rather than the things that might be emailing behind the scenes, um, as many of the volunteer opportunities tend to be at schools. And it's not all on you. So don't feel bad if you need to ask your spouse for help or to hire someone outside of the home. It takes a village. Our ancestors literally had villages to help them. Us trying to do it all of ourselves is just not possible in the same way that if you have a bunch of people helping you might be. That is great advice. I love that. What strategies have you found effective in overcoming the fear or intimidation associated with taking risks, because you've taken a lot of risks as a woman in the private equity and finance sectors. I've tried to think about things as rationally as possible. And if I'm not feeling in the mood to be as rational as I need to be, take a step away. So when I pivoted from practicing law to litigation finance, I, I thought through the downside of things and what would be the worst that could happen if I decided this wasn't for me. Would things be additive to my resume or would it take away from things and foreclose possibilities? And with this particular opportunity, I felt that it would be additive. 
And I did tell some close colleagues, here are my clients, but if I end up really regretting this decision and coming back, don't get too cozy with them. <laughs> so I think that definitely that looking at the downside, looking at how likely something is to go wrong or right based on what you know, as opposed to just being swayed by the person you met or the office you visited. Yeah, I think I do the kind of worst case scenario thing. And what I think is helpful to do is to be realistic about that worst case scenario and don't ruminate over it. Be truly realistic. This is the worst thing that's going to happen if this doesn't work out. Right. And can you get through that? That's it. So can you share a little bit a personal experience when you took a calculated risk and it substantially contributed to where you are now? Yes, I, I think the the pivoting from the practice of law to litigation funding was was the first big pivot. Those of you in the practice of law can really, you know, it takes a long time and you have a lot of your identity tied up in being a lawyer and passed three bar exams and I had a, a good job and they say golden handcuffs and it's hard to walk away. And I was maybe a year from making partner if I continued on that track. And then I stopped and asked myself, who am I doing this for? Is it something I really want to do? Do I like what that looks like down the line? Or should I take a risk on doing something that could maybe make me happier? And I realized that I'd be checking a box and not doing something that would necessarily make me happy. I could always go back to practicing law if I wanted to, but this opportunity wouldn't be there if I didn't go for it. And I'm super glad that I did that. And before we go to our final question, um, Meredith, I just wanted to make sure, because you've really given some great answers and insights. Is there anything else that you want to share with our audience about your path or where you are, You know how you help your women colleagues, how you help co uh, women that you interface with in business, anything else you want to add? I would say a lot of the people on our team, both women and men, tend to be people that have a lot of promise and a lot of skills, but maybe not in a position where they could be their best. And aside from modernizing the asset-based lending world, which is a professional mission of ours, a personal mission is to cut down the barriers to success that my team has and so they can be the best versions of themselves. So recruiting you know, women and men who may have had these blocks and either helping them through it if it's something that they may require some coaching or giving them an opportunity to be them, their best selves is really what gets me up every day from a team perspective. That's amazing. Thanks. So our kind of signature question that we ask all of the women that we interview is the following. What advice would you give your younger self? And by younger self, I'm thinking either the 22-year-old self who graduated from college or the self that graduated from law school. I would say look at what you like and you don't like. It's not just the title of being a lawyer or eventually being a partner. It's how you're going to spend your day. Do you, do you like being behind the computer and looking at the same document for days at a time? <laughs> or do you want to be out more in the world and interacting with people more on a, on a daily basis? I think times have since changed that you could do a lot of that on Zoom. But I would also say get an MBA. I feel like I had to get an MBA on the job and I can't imagine having the time or energy to go back and do that now. So uh, Villanova Law had a JD MBA program. I wish I would, would have just gone that extra year and, and uh, gotten that degree. I would say, say yes to opportunities that come along. You're never going to be more flexible than you are at the beginning of your career to take risks. Ask for feedback, like really ask for feedback. Don't just say it to say it. Really figure out where you can improve and seek happiness because you only go around once. Meredith, thank you so much for these great answers and, and for taking time to, to share them with our listeners. To our listeners, if you have an idea about a question or a theme or you want to nominate somebody, please hang on and listen to uh, the outro where you'll be given information on how to do that. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you for joining us at the table for this episode of Deal Us In. If you have a recommendation for an inspiring interviewee, a question you'd like us to ask, 
or topic you would like to hear covered. Or if you'd like to tell us about women-focused initiatives in the field, please email us at wpef at mcguirewoods.com. We look forward to hearing from you. This podcast was recorded and is being made available by McGuire Woods for informational purposes only. By accessing this podcast, you acknowledge that McGuire Woods makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in the podcast. The views, information, or opinions expressed during this podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily reflect those of McGuire Woods. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice from a licensed professional attorney in your state and should not be construed as an offer to make or consider any investment or course of action.